Do I begin? Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome our speakers and you are our guests to the European University Institute this afternoon for a Schumann conversation on the priorities for transatlantic relations over the next four years. US-European relations have always been close, interspersed inevitably with some tension. However, the past four years have been truly distinctive and troubling. For the first time in the post-war era, there is a US president in the White House who bears a deep antipathy to the European Union and everything it stands for. President-elect Biden will bring a welcome change given his track record and his well-documented views. For example, at the Munich Security Conference 2013, he said, I continue to believe that Europe is the cornerstone of our engagement with the rest of the world and catalyst for our global cooperation. But there can be no return to a pre-Trump world. Rather, Europe must now focus on how to reboot transatlantic relations given the fortuna of a Biden win. I can think of no better, more accomplished speakers to address the priorities for transatlantic relations over the next cycle than our guests today. We're joined by two distinguished diplomats, Anthony Gardner, who was US ambassador to Brussels under President Obama from March 14 until January 20, 2017. I wonder what happened that day. And David O'Sullivan, who was his counterpart as EU ambassador to Washington from 2014 to 2019. I have also asked Professor Stephanie Hoffman from the Graduate Institute Geneva and incoming EUI Joint Chair in International Relations to join us today. Stephanie will be Director of the Europe and the World Programme of the Schumann Global Governance Programme and we look forward very much to welcoming Stephanie's arrival as a colleague. Let me first hand over to Anthony Gardner, whose 2020 volume, uh, Stars with Stripes, is a pivotal assessment of US-European uh, relations covering the economic, uh, the security and the global ties that bind our two parts of the world. I am particularly pleased to say that some of this book was written in this building and on the terraces outside. So Anthony, the floor is yours and it is wonderful to welcome you back, albeit remotely to the Schumann Center. Well, it is great to be back virtually with you. Um, and thank you so much for mentioning the book. Indeed, a lot of it was written on the beautiful terraces in Fiesole, and it's a wonderful institution. And congratulations to you for all that you've done there. And it's good to be reunited with my friend David. In fact, we used to write each other's talking points, essentially. Um, and uh, we got a lot done, and it would be great to collaborate in the future. And Stephanie, it's great to, to meet you virtually. We have an opportunity with this new uh, incoming administration, but it's an opportunity and perhaps, you know, uh, we, we shouldn't overstate it. Uh, I hope we don't use the word reset because it has such bad connotations because it was used, of course, with our relations with Russia under the Obama administration. I think we have a real opportunity to get things done. I say that because um, I joined the um, team, the campaign from day one. I've known the candidate for a long time. I've worked with him in Brussels. I knew him when he was a senator. Of course, I speak as a private citizen, but Europe cannot imagine a more uh, pro-European and even pro-EU administration than the one that's about to take office. And I think many of the people on the call might, might remember the speech that uh, Biden gave at uh, the European Parliament in Strasbourg in 2011, where he stated very clearly his views. Um, they're personally held, they're sincerely held. Um, now, it's true that the country faces enormous challenges domestically. That's, that's obvious. 80%, uh, something like that, will be focused on domestic policy and about 20% on foreign policy. So very small bandwidth, and the time is short and a lot of pressure, of course, to, to move ahead, which is why in all the work that these groups, these working groups of the campaign have been doing over the last six months, um, the, the focus has been what can be done uh, relatively quickly, let's say 18 to 24 months, what is meaningful and what's relatively uncontroversial. Meaning let's leave aside the disputes of the past. And we all know what that means. You know, we, we fought over some things, including a TTIP, which unfortunately were a distraction. 
So I think the pressure will be on both sides to really focus on what is meaningful in trade and in non-trade areas. Another thing which bears stating, even though it's perhaps obvious, is that this is not going to be Obama 3.0. And no one is naive enough to believe that we can wind back the clock and that Donald Trump never existed, that, that Trumpism will go away because very much Trumpism will be around. And the results of the election bear that out. Um, you know, in terms of electoral votes, it's a very nice victory by a wider margin that Donald Trump won. However, uh, it's very clear, you know, 70 million Americans voted for Donald Trump and Trumpism will be there. So if we fail, together with our allies, particularly with the EU, and moving forward on a number of areas I'll mention very, very briefly, then I fear that we will be back toward a more virulent form of demagogic populism in four years, whether it's Donald Trump 2.0 or Ivanka 1.0. So um, it, perhaps I can just mention very quickly, bring in a few areas where I hope we can get movement. Um, if you bear with me, maybe in five minutes or so. Um, here's my list on where I think we can make some progress uh, on non-trade areas. Uh, not surprisingly, I will put climate number one. Uh, it's a, perhaps at the top of the agenda in Europe, and it's perhaps close to the top of the agenda of the incoming administration. We will rejoin the Paris Climate Accords, but as we all know, um, the, old, um, the old objectives have to be uh, tightened uh, further because we've lost a number of years uh, in doing so. Um, and the U.S. will play, as it did before, a key role in bringing China into the fold. Hopefully, Xi Jinping's statement uh, will be translated into reality. Uh, hopefully, the Senate will be cooperative uh, in uh, the green agenda that's been sketched forth by the Biden administration. A lot of spending is attached to that, so it's a question mark. It depends on how we do in Georgia in early January. Um, I would like us as well to restart a stalled negotiation on environmental goods agreement with the EU, which is important. It was intended to eliminate tariffs on green goods. Um, we'll certainly reaffirm the importance of NATO to transatlantic defense, and probably I would think revisit the decision to pull troops out of Germany, which was a political decision out of peak against uh, Chancellor Merkel. Uh, the military in the United States most of the top brass is also criticized as being political and counterproductive to U.S. interests. Uh, rejoin the WHO, of course, that makes no sense in fighting the global pandemic because no country can be safe if we don't solve this pandemic uh, on a global basis. Effort will be made to save the Iran nuclear accords. Again, no one is naive enough to think that this is going to be easy, but an effort will be made. There will be pressure to extend the, the term and the scope of that agreement for sure. I just don't know whether that will be possible, but an effort certainly will be made because the, the region is no safer uh, after the U.S. withdrawal and now Iran's um, uh, activities to increase its, uh, uh, its fish and material and it um, uh, has been breaching the terms of the agreement itself. I would like us to work more closely together on combating this uh, crisis, this virus, and uh, future pandemics. Um, I would like to see the U.S. join COVAX. It's crazy that we haven't joined COVAX, of course. A lot that we can do in terms of um, not only joint research, uh, a lot on, on, on trade, on limiting tariffs, on relevant products, medicines, uh, protective equipment, and so forth. Uh, I would like to, to see us collaborate on the digital health pass to restart travel across the Atlantic. Um, and perhaps stockpiling of medicines and so forth. We should work on countering propaganda and election interference by Russia and China and other um, uh, malicious actors. Uh, we both have suffered from this. I think we have to revisit our sanctions on Russia. That's going to be a difficult topic for sure, but there's unfinished business. Certainly the view in the United States is that there's unfinished business from the prior election uh, where Russia interfered, um, uh, and that is very widely understood and known. Um, continue to work on diminishing European energy um, uh, dependency on Russia, although here the tactics will be different and the tone certainly quite different with regard to Nord Stream 2. And I think it's a much broader debate than just one pipeline. We can discuss that maybe later. We certainly are going to have to address this very important issue of the courts, EU courts and validation of Privacy Shield. Again, not an easy topic. I was involved. David, of course, was intimately involved. Um, there are some things that we can do to, to tweak, to improve that, but to address the core concern of judicial redress for EU citizens in the U.S. courts is not going to be an easy thing. And I think many of us have read the guidelines of the European Data Protection Board, which seem to indicate that the only 
secure way of transmitting data is by encryption, which poses some issues for law enforcement. Um, a lot of uh, work that we need to do on digital economy issues, we can discuss this later on perhaps in, in, uh, in our, in our uh, discussion, but here, you know, is the EU works to have a Digital Services Act um, and uh, change its, uh, update its electronic uh, e-commerce directive. And as in the United States, we're beginning to look at the role of online um, platforms, uh, particularly their role in, in democratic debate. Um, we need to align wherever possible our uh, policies with regard to illegal content, um, harmful content online, and uh, look beyond the antitrust tools that we have at our disposal. And then finally, uh, quickly, reestablish closer coordination on rule of law, good governance, and anti-corruption, which, uh, you know, where the EU has been a leader, we've been absent for four, for four years. Uh, these are topics that uh, President-elect Biden cares deeply about. Uh, very quickly on trade, just a few minutes on trade. Uh, there is a lot that we can do. Uh, there won't be a T to 2.0, I'm sure David, <laughs> will agree with me on that. We have too many scars on our back. Um, it was a big disappointment, I think, to uh, a lot of us, uh, but we made some mistakes and we're not going to repeat them. Uh, there are meaningful things that we can do and how important it is that we do do them. You know, now with the RCEP agreement that many of you saw signed in Asia, which is uh, certainly a broad, not very deep, a very broad agreement, the political message is clear that if we don't actually collaborate, Asia will move ahead without us. So I would like us to eliminate tariffs on industrial goods trade. We did it in TTIP. We can actually do it now pretty quickly if it's accompanied by some movement on agriculture. And here I'm not thinking of all of the, the old uh, battle horses, uh, you know, the war horses of uh, uh, chlorinated chicken and hormone treated beef and all that stuff. No, no, no. I'm, I'm thinking of some very specific issues on plant and animal health, which have been problematic for the United States. I think some of them are not particularly controversial and I think we can get movement. Airbus Boeing dispute, I think there's a desire on both sides to actually sit down and try to get this uh, dispute settled. Um, I, I would like us to lift sanctions on aluminum steel with no, no preconditions, no preconditions. And I wrote a couple of papers for the campaign arguing that those tariffs should never have been imposed. They were an abuse of executive privilege. And I hope we do not require uh, anything except for the lifting of counter sanctions from the EU. I, I would like us to lift the veto on the dispute summit by um, members uh, and together collaborate with the EU on the new director general of the WTO. Uh, I would like us to move ahead with a free trade agreement with, uh, with the UK. I think it's uh, doable, maybe not economically very significant, but very doable and important for the digital economy chapter and financial services chapter particularly. And there are things that we can do with the EU on mutual recognition, expand the, the scope of the uh, pharmaceutical uh, agreement uh, that we, we signed that avoids duplicative testing of uh, pharmaceutical facilities. Um, and I think there are things that we can do in non-safety auto regulations for sure with the EU. We, we tried that in TTIP, but we focused on the safety side, which was just too hard and we finally didn't get agreement. And most importantly, we should be sitting down right away even though this is a longer term piece of work, we should be sitting out right away with our friends in the EU to drive reform of WTO rules. You know, the great white paper that the EU has is, is, is put out, I think contains excellent ideas, many of which I suspect that we agree with, uh, and we should be doing that as soon as possible. Build, we should be building on the US EU Japan uh, agreement on industrial subsidies, which contains uh, important uh, proposals. Uh, we should work together at the G20 to phase out subsidies for fossil fuels, especially coal. We should establish a US EU Trade and Technology Council to discuss standards for emerging technologies and how important this is. For me, this is a top three issue. It's a very technical issue, but it's a top three issue. The Chinese have clearly identified this is uh, of fundamental importance. And indeed, they have placed five of their people at the head of international standard setting organizations, clearly with the intention to, to, to build in an advantage for their exporters, set not only the rules, but values for a large part of the world. So we should be doing that. And finally, aligning policies on supply chain resilience and diversification. Um, so let me stop there. There's a lot on the table. Uh, but the message, and I think David would agree, is, you know, the, the history will judge us very harshly if we do not um, make progress on at least uh, a large number of these. We have two years and we need to we need to move forward. Thanks.
Okay, thank you very much. That's a very crowded agenda for two years. So David, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bridget. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, I mean, I fear anyone viewing this who's hoping to see a, a dust up between myself and Tony is going to be extremely disappointed because I, I pretty much agreed with everything that he said. Um, but as Steve Hadley once said, everything has been said, but not yet by everyone. So let me make my contribution. Um, I think the Biden victory is is a, is very good news for for America, obviously, um, for for the global community. I would say, but particularly for Europe, uh, we have suffered enormously over the last four years. I'm not going to rake over the ashes again. But as you said in your introductory remarks, uh, Bridget, it was not just the individual disputes, uh, the putting into question of Article 5 in, in NATO. It was the deep antipathy to the very existence and, and raison d'etre of the European Union, which was uh, absolutely new territory in, in transatlantic relations and went against everything that the US has been doing since since 1945. So I, I, I think um, damage has been done, uh, but fortunately, uh, we now have the opportunity to correct it. Uh, I think President Biden or future President Biden uh, will be uh, will mark a return to a somewhat more traditional uh, American approach to uh, transatlantic relations, to global relations. Uh, Tony has already touched on this. I mean, his deep commitment uh, to Europe, to the relationship with Europe, as you cited his words in the uh, Munich Security Conference. I think he also said that in the same speech that he regarded uh, Europe and the United States as each other's best friend of first resort. Um, so I, I think all of this is, is hugely good news. Uh, and it's not just a, a change of tone and style, but also a policy, as Tony has uh, enumerated. Uh, he will bring America back into the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, he will rejoin the WHO. Um, he will come back to the table on the JCPOA. I agree with Tony that putting that back together again is not going to be easy because the Iranians uh, feel very burned by the experience of agreeing this with Obama and then having Trump overturn it and all that has happened. And of course, they have themselves started to deviate from elements of the agreement. So that's going to be a tricky dossier. But having the US back at the table in a constructive way will be a, a huge positive. Um, and, and so I think there is an opportunity here. Um, equally, uh, I think we have to be clear eyed and realistic. Uh, the, the, the less good news for Europeans or for transatlanticists is that while this election appears to have been a fairly solid rejection of President Trump as a, as a character, um, the Republican Party and the policies he has espoused over the last four years actually didn't do too badly. I mean, the Republicans actually had quite a good election. They won back some seats in, in the House. They look like holding the Senate. I mean, we wait to see with bated breath what will happen in Georgia in, in January. Um, if the uh, Democrats win the jackpot and they get uh, they win the two seats, then we have a 50 50 tie in the Senate and Kamala Harris has the casting vote. So that's really a nice position uh, for 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 President Biden. Uh, Winning less than the two will basically put him in the hands of Mitch McConnell, uh, and we know how difficult uh, that relationship can be between uh, a Democratic president uh, and uh, a Republican-controlled Senate. And getting um, even his team uh, approved uh, in the next six months, uh, in the six months after after he's inaugurated on the 20th of January, could prove very challenging uh, if if. If the Republicans decide to play uh, hardball, to use a, an American expression, so uh, the focus is inevitably going to be on domestic politics, dealing with the uh, horrendous impact of the pandemic in America, dealing with the economic consequences, uh, and I think, as, as President, future President Biden himself said, uh, you know, he's not going to rush to get involved in trade deals and so on until he feels he has sorted out. The situation of the of the U.S. economy and U.S. workers, uh, education and training, investment, and so forth. So th there is going to be a heavy uh, domestic focus, and I think the other um, important thing for us in Europe to to note about what is happening in America uh, is the the underlying structural changes which which are driving 
what has happened because the you know the the sort of change in american attitudes towards the rest of the world started with obama uh, and these are the 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 sort of fatigue in the body politic from the blood and treasure lost in the endless wars of of iraq and afghanistan um, the, 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 the deindustrialization of parts of, of the United States blamed on globalization or on NAFTA, um, the increasing polarization, the culture wars, uh, the, the, the really lack of, of any kind of constructive dialogue between the two tribes of Republicans and Democrats who kind of even live in, in different spaces, you know, and I believe it's even an issue on online dating that people will, <laughs> so I don't, I, not, not a Republican, you know, so, uh, or not a Democrat. So, I mean, it, it, this, is, this is having a big impact on, on the United States, as well as the demographic changes. Uh, we in Europe are, are used to the sort of family ties with the United States, which drive a lot of the, the good relations uh, I myself have many more relatives in, in California than I do than I do in Ireland. Uh, but those, that's changing. And by, I think, 2045, um, uh, the majority of Americans will no longer be of, of basically European origin, but will be of a much more diverse and, and heterogeneous origin. And part of the challenge for us in the future is going to be to explain to African Americans, to South Asian, Indian Americans, Native Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans, and Hispanic Americans come in different shapes and sizes, whether they came from Mexico or from Puerto Rico or from Cuba, that the, the transatlantic relationship is important for them too. Uh, that you don't have to, uh, like Joe Biden, be very proud of your Irish roots uh, to or your German roots or your or your Italian roots uh, to actually see that there is value for the United States in in a, a constructive and engaged relationship with uh, the Europeans uh, and particularly the European Union. So uh, I think I entirely agree with Tony that I think we have a window of opportunity here. I, I've written on previous occasions uh, a last perhaps a last chance to reinvent the transatlantic relationship for the 21st century. Uh, to, if you like, buttress that relationship against the structural changes in the U.S., which are going to continue to come. And I agree with Tony, who knows what will happen in 2024. Uh, uh, and I think if we haven't anchored the relationship in, in new realities uh, uh, of the kind he has described uh, during the course of the, the next couple of years, uh, it may, you know, there is a risk that the next time round, the rift could be even greater. Uh, and I think that's a, something we have to take very seriously. And so for me, this does put a, a huge responsibility on Europe to take more responsibility. Uh, we could debate uh, strategic autonomy or open strategic autonomy, certainly not um, autarky or certainly not protectionism and certainly not isolationism, but basically to take more responsibility for our own affairs, what's happening in our neighborhood, where the US, I think, will be supportive, but will not wish to um, uh, get involved heavily. Uh, and, you know, we need to agree a transatlantic agenda. And I think the elements are there, as Tony had said, support for multilateralism. Uh, NATO, we need to remedy the American sense that the Europeans are not doing enough. Uh, I have my own views as to whether the, the 2% target is the best way to do that or whether more European uh, cooperation might not be more effective. Um, we need to look at the trade agenda uh, to try and take some of the sting out of the ongoing disputes, whether that's Airbus Boeing or, as Tony said, we also need to find some positive things, including in agriculture, which is not simple. Anytime I mention this, uh, I get heavily criticized, uh, but like Tony, I'm not suggesting we do anything about hormone beef or GMOs or chlorinated chicken, but I think there are things we could do where both sides would feel that the play playing field was a little more level uh, for agriculture, uh, agricultural producers on both sides of the Atlantic. We have the digital agenda. We have China uh, to find some common understanding. Uh, and all, all the other stuff that Tony mentioned, I, I, I fully agree. The, the, the challenge, to be honest, from this big agenda is to actually make something happen. Uh, and I think, I hope that uh, once the Biden administration is up and running, uh, people will come from Europe with a plan, at least uh, our plan, as to how we can do this, so that together 
we can say, okay, realistically, out of this long list, these are the top priorities. Let's work really on this. Uh, and let's work on other stuff as well. Let's try to avoid new conflicts like digital services tax or uh, regulation of tech platforms. Uh, let's try to anticipate uh, those kind of situations and, and avoid them turning into new confrontations. And let's build a new transatlantic relationship. But I, I emphasize, I think that the burden ultimately falls on Europe not only to take the initiative, but also to do things ourselves, which make us a stronger partner uh, for the United States and which, to build a more enduring relationship to take into account the, the, the many changes that are happening in American society and American policy. Thank you, Stephanie, a response to what you've heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget, for inviting me, first of all. It's a pleasure to actually discuss Tony and uh, David's ideas. Pleasure to meet you virtually. I've been working on transatlantic relations for a while, particularly on security policy, and hence I'm actually really excited to ask you a few questions. But maybe, may I start out by echoing first that President Biden won't find himself in the same world, both domestically and internationally, that he left as vice president at the very beginning of 2017. And the world has changed, and I don't think it's in the US power to actually bring it back to 2017. So. When um, the Paris mayor, I think it was, Anne Hidalgo tweeted, welcome back America, we can really ask, welcome back to what exactly? Is Biden able to renew and repair relationships and commitments that have been put into question under Trump? Or do we rather have to redefine maybe and, and reinvent the transatlantic relationship that resonates a bit with what David just said? Um, and that might echo more with German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas, who ask for a new deal. So in short, my overall question to you is, what do you think can be repaired and what needs to be redefined or created anew? But, but I have a few more questions. So the first one will be on multilateralism. Trump's America first policy has put a big question mark behind US sponsored multilateralism to say the least. And uh, we could say, I think, that the golden age of global multilateralism is arguably over. Um, you pointed out that the Biden presidency certainly will push for more multilateralism. But I'd like to discuss a little bit further what kind of multilateralism we should actually expect. So my first question is whether Biden will really be able to reinvigorate global multilateralism at large. And by, by this, I mean, uh, make us believe in the value of multilateralism again, or whether he has to look into more specific and hence also potentially more exclusive cooperation projects. So, I mean, granted, he promised to sign the Paris Agreement and he wants to halt the US leaving the WHO, which is in the process of going on right now. But will he, for example, be able to bring new life in the UN Security Council or the WTO? And um, I'm not sure that even when it comes to the one of the oldest, I guess, and arguably most successful US sponsored organizations, namely NATO, that we will be able to repair everything. That said, maybe NATO is a great example that going back to what we had before is not always in the most desirable outcome, both for the US and for Europe. Um, as you pointed out, Biden is an Atlanticist. I mean, he showed this during his time in the Senate when, while he was vice president. And he's been quoted to, by, to have said that NATO's Article 5 is a sacred duty. And I can clearly envision that Biden will change the rhetoric towards allies and maybe frame the burden sharing debate, which is almost as old as the alliance, away from you have to pay more to you should contribute more to our collective security. But will he be able and willing to renegotiate what the actual burden is constituted of? I mean, many European countries have now argued for years that they're already contributing to transatlantic security through other means than military spending, for example. So will Biden accept this redefinition of burden, according to you, and then maybe also consequently uh, admit and accept the military burden that the US is carrying within NATO? And um, on the other hand, should the EU really take strategic autonomy seriously? Will a Biden administration, in your view, support it unconditionally? 
So these are my questions to multilateralism. I have also a question about domestic politics. I mean, as you mentioned, national populism is a political power to reckon with, with both in the US, but also in Europe now. And um, this deeply divides and polarizes the US, as the recent election has shown, for example, but it also divides European countries and the EU. So according to you, how do you see these ideological forces being reconciled with a open and cooperation seeking US and European foreign policies where not every move is transactional? I'd briefly like to turn also to bureaucratic politics and domestic institutions. I'm not sure this might be more of a question for Tony than for David, but David, given his US experience, I'm sure can also speak to this. So you addressed the Senate, but I'm also curious what you think about what will happen in the State Department. Because during the Trump administration, the State Department was, was sidelined. I mean, senior diplomats were forced out of their jobs or resigned in protest to some of his controversial policies. Trump, I think, was one of the presidents who appointed most politically, uh, politically appointed most ambassadors. Um, some were talking about the State Department being hollowed out during his administration. So, um, Reports basically said like that that was not much expertise when it comes to foreign policy formulation in the State Department, and so I'm I'm wondering, given that Trump is re-emphasizing the role of expertise, he has done this when he talks about climate change, about um, how to approach COVID-19 and the spread of the uh, pandemic. I wonder how you see this the role of expertise in the State Department for Biden. I mean, will it will he be fast in re-empowering the State Department, in moving expertise into, into the department? I'd be curious to hear a little bit more, given that arguably that matters a lot in the way international negotiations are being conducted. Um, a fourth question briefly is about geopolitics and what colleagues in the US like to term great power politics. So both the US and the EU see China as a systemic rival. But I wonder whether you think that this will lead to the same kind of, say, either engagement or confrontation policy. It seems to me that uh, given its economic ties and geopolitical position, European countries are more inclined to push for a pragmatist policy towards China, at least for, for the time being, that is. And the US actually, who might arguably lose much more from China's rise, uh, might be more conf confrontational. So I wonder, whether you see it in the same kind of light and whether that actually also means that the US has, US has to change for different kind of allies or different kind of special relationships. And lastly, I promise this last question, at least for now, I wonder about expectation management. So how can both the EU and its member states, but also the US manage each other's expectations? It strikes me that especially at the moment in Europe, we are already setting the bar too high in terms of what we can expect from a Biden administration. An administration that has domestic politics to tend to in the times of a pandem pandemic. So will the next trade friction be called a move back to the Trump era, thereby ignoring that many such frictions existed before Trump came to power? And will the next burden sharing debate ring alarm bells and convince Europeans that the US is about to abandon NATO? How can reasonable expectations be communicated? I leave it there this for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Can I suggest, because there are a lot of very rich questions there, that perhaps we begin with the questions about repair or reinvent in terms of global multilateralism, NATO, collective security and strategic autonomy, and then we move on to the other issues. So perhaps, Tony, if you want to take um, what can be repaired, what must be reinvented, uh, and what kind of multilateralism uh, can we envisage in the future? Well, those are critical issues. You know, I get back to the point I was making at the beginning, the time is short and we're gonna have to be pretty brutally honest about what we can do in that short period of time. So reinventing anything is probably impossible. Uh, we're not gonna save multilateralism. We're not going back to global age for sure. We need to do what is meaningful. And by that, you know, if it's if it's uh, plurilateral agreements, I mentioned one of them, the environmental goods agreement, we should do it. If we can move ahead with the US EU on, on trade, we, we should do it. If we can move ahead on a bilateral basis with the UK, uh, we should do it. Um, where we can, we should try to save the multilateral order. I mentioned that the WTO is being an example, but we're not gonna 
we're not going to reinvent it uh, for sure. Um, on, on NATO as well, uh, we can fix it. We can shift its direction, its focus, particularly on um, the softer issues, which are like cyber, uh, very relevant for NATO. We can push for greater EU-NATO cooperation. Um, I agree, by the way, with your point that uh, burden sharing should be seen more broadly. I think actually an incoming Biden administration would be sympathetic that sharing burdens mean, meaning, uh, should, should mean sharing climate burdens, should mean burdens on migration and other burdens, not just the, the spending 2% on defense. But you know what, none of that matters because the Senate's going to be watching, Congress is going to be watching, and they're going to be expecting movement on spending in terms of euros. Uh, and so something clearly will need to be done. Look, on strategic autonomy, I think this is a debate which um, is interesting to watch. I find it rather academic. Uh, my personal view is that if the United States stands at risk of being disappointed, it'll be disappointed because Europe doesn't do enough rather than does too much and undermines NATO. So anything actually that results in a greater capacity of Europe to act, the capacity to act, which is the phrase I prefer to strategic autonomy, then good. But Europe should get on and do it, not only spend more, but spend better on, on uh, common platforms uh, and ability to, to, to defend itself. The, the last thing I'll say is, it, you know, the big issue for many people in Congress and, and among the American public, which is a really important audience here, it's the voters, is how we actually get things done better with our allies, particularly the EU, on China, on trade with China, period. Everything else is nice to talk about, but that's the issue. So, um, and maybe that's not an issue necessarily with multilateralism, even though there's a connection to fixing the rules with our allies. But if we can't show to voters on both sides of the Atlantic that we get more done together within the context of these rules, in terms of getting the Chinese to correct their abusive trade and market access practices, then we will have failed. That's, I think that's the big, big issue. David? Yeah, I, I think on the question of multilateralism, um, there is no single answer to this um, because certain th I mean, you take climate change. This has to be multilateral. Uh, we, we in Europe are, are I think, one of the leaders in, in doing things in our own area, but it's not sufficient. Uh, and the US uh, notwithstanding President Trump, in fact, America Inc. has actually been doing quite a lot uh, against climate change and, and green, advancing the green agenda, which will now get a boost uh, from President Biden. Uh, but again, we need we need a global response. We need the rest of the world working together. So certain problems uh, require um, absolute uh, cooperation across uh, you know the planet. Uh, I think doing something about future pandemics will clearly need uh, the WHO uh, uh, and and uh, a really international effort. Uh, it's no good just doing it on the global basis because pandemics don't uh, lead to lead to no frontiers. Uh, on the other hand, I agree with, with Tony that you can then do things, there are certain things you can do more regionally. You take arms control or something like that. I mean, then it's a smaller set of, of actors. So I think we have to be flexible. I mean, not everything needs to be managed on the planetary level, but some things do. And I think making making the choice between those distinctions, uh, including in the WTO, uh, and I agree with Tony that um, we need to reform the WTO. The WTO now in, it is a, almost a planetary organization, but trade doesn't necessarily need to be managed on the planetary level, right? And so you can have uh, coalitions of the willing, you can have plurilateral agreements, and so forth. So the 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 the, the method of, of work uh, in promoting greater international cooperation and the degree of multilateralism can be flexible. Uh, and I think one of the things would be for us uh, with the U.S. to discuss a bit how what is our joint perception of that. Where are the places where we think we really need uh, the maximum number of people around the table, and where are the areas where we think uh, there can be subgroups? And maybe sometimes that would be something managed more by the Americans or more by the Europeans. Uh, we can even have a notional division of labor uh, about the, in these kind of situations. Everything to do with our region and around Europe, I, I think the Americans would be delighted if we took more responsibility. Uh, it's probably not a top priority. Uh, Africa the same. I think uh, 
uh, America is interested in Africa, but for us, it's our it's actually our, our neighborhood, and I think we should we should be active there. Um, so, I, on the question of NATO, um, I think the the real state of Article Five is absolutely crucial. Not reinstatement, but I mean the, the, the reaffirmation. I mean, I think the, the deep fact damage that Trump did to the fabric of NATO was the undermining of the um, uh, Article 5. And uh, a firm uh, reaffirmation by Biden that America stands by Article 5 is, is a much needed boost uh, to NATO. Uh, then we need to discuss, as Tony says, you know, what are the, in, the, in the 21st century, what are the things that NATO can usefully do? And we, as Europeans, need to decide what is we're going to uh, and I agree again with Tony. The important thing is that we just do it. Uh, and we demonstrate that we follow through on these ideas of more, co more cooperation in the area of defense, and pooling and sharing, uh, reducing the, the multiplicity of weapon systems, getting more value for money. Uh, but I agree with Tony that at the end of the day, we have to, it has to, it has to demonstrate that this is making a difference. Uh, and we need to be sensitive to the fact that this is what President Biden is going to be judged on in due course by the American public, by, by the Congress. Uh, and we have to make our contribution to that, which I think is also in our own interest. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we just do it uh, as a favor to Biden. We should do it because it's in our own best interest to develop uh, greater autonomy, greater capacity uh, to act and intervene than is currently the case. Uh, and that will make us a better partner uh, for the United States. And that's a kind of win-win situation. And I think you kind of replicate that then through the rest of the agenda. I'm not going to take up the China point, because I think that was another one of your questions. And Bridget, I don't know how you want to kind of go through that. But. Yes, we, we come back to China, but let's let's address the, the politics questions. Firstly, domestic politics, populism, polarization, which isn't just a challenge in the United States, but of course uh, in, in, in Europe as well. And then that uh, the bureaucratic politics, particularly the capacity of the US State Department, the quality of expertise and the hollowing out that occurred under, uh, on, under President Trump. So perhaps, Tony, if you would like to start with those. Those are also very, very relevant questions. Look on the State Department, it's, a, you know, no super tanker can change direction uh, in a few months or years even. Uh, it has been hollowed out. It certainly had crises before, for sure. Periods where morale was low, but I think it's fair to say it's never been lower because essentially, and I don't think I'm overstating the case here, Stephanie, that this administration saw the State Department as a nest of traitors because they were populated by people by definition who have traveled a lot, very well educated, and tend, tend to vote Democratic, and therefore are, are uh, suspected of not supporting the administration. I actually know a lot of anecdotes that go directly to this, honestly. I know a few ambassadors who, uh, in their morning meetings, asked the staff, you know, how many of you actually voted Republican? There are too many Democrats here. I mean, incredible stuff that never been really seen before. This is not going to be easy to fix. And it will take time to recruit people, many of them who could have new careers, did leave. Um, so you're right, this is a big issue. Personnel is policy. Uh, but the State Department will be, again, back in, uh, very much in the front lines. I don't know who's going to be the, the new Secretary of State, some great names being considered, who have had a lot of experience in that organization. Um, look on populism, Obviously, hugely relevant. The statistics, the data, is very revealing. I think David said it very well. Um, you know, Trumpism does not defeat it here, to be clear. Uh, and some a few worrying signals for the Democrats, now, particularly in terms of the Latino vote. Any Democrats who assumed that the Latinos were safely, quote unquote, in the pocket of the Democratic Party clearly were uh, not, uh, you know, were being too optimistic. Um, the, the Latinos can, can, vote in many different directions depending on where they've passed and where they've, they've come from. Um, they're, the country is more divided than ever before. I mean, we knew that, but the education is certainly one of the key dividing lines. Uh, it's not religion. It's not ethnicity. Uh, it, it's education more than anything else. Uh, suburbia clearly moved uh, in a direction favoring um, the president-elect. 
Um, but Trump increased the percentage of his vote, not only among evangelicals, uh, but held uh, he held his uh, vote and the turnout increased actually in some cases for the rural white males. Um, so, you know, we have to listen to these people clearly. You know, I think, and that, that message has is, is been received in the incoming administration. Um, and it gets to the point that David said that we need to at least address some of the causes of frustration among those voters. The system is not working for them. That's a much bigger problem. So we're gonna need an infrastructure bill. We're gonna to need to change the way we think about trade, see how we can make sure the benefits are more properly, fairly allocated. Uh, and we're gonna to have to look at our tax system as well. Again, not easy because we have ascended in the hand of the addressing the built-in advantages um, for the well-off uh, and making sure that middle-income uh, wages uh, are, don't stagnate uh, and that there is a, a more a fair uh, economy that works for all. You know, we're going to be in, in trouble if we, we can't address some of the Thank you. Uh, David, uh, you would have interacted very intensively with the State Department when you were in Washington. And did you experience this problem of morale and hollowing out and very fine American diplomats just feeling that their expertise was being disregarded. Very definitely. I mean, I, I have enormous respect for the State Department, uh, always had uh, from uh, the before I was ambassador, but my dealings with uh, US diplomats, highly professional, highly dedicated, uh, and clearly they were deeply affected by initially Secretary of State Tillerson, who you know, didn't have perhaps the best interpersonal skills or, you know, kind of came to it from a sort of uh, private sector uh, approach. Um, in some ways, Secretary Pompeo engaged more, um, but there was a general distrust uh, of the diplomatic establishment. Uh, and this was felt deeply, I think, by, by State Department officials. Uh, their advice uh, was not really taken on board or at least listened to. I'm not saying that any diplomat uh, expects their advice immediately to be followed, but you want to feel you've at least got a good hearing. Uh, and I think some very good people have left, and I think the morale is is poor. I, I'm a bit more optimistic than Tony that this can be turned around relatively quickly, because I think there are a lot of good people who could be brought in, and I'm sure uh, um, future President Biden will, will, will make good choices for, you know, Secretary of State, for Deputy Secretary of State, uh, for his National Security Advisor, because the relationship with the White House and, and the State Department is also very, very important with the, the, the NSA. So uh, I, I, I think it's not too difficult uh, to give this a, a, a bit of a boost and to, to bring back in some of the, the, the quality people. But yeah, it's 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 one of the one of the thing one of the to do things on 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 this administration's list, I think, because uh, as was pointed out very clearly, I think by General Mattis when he was Secretary of Defense, um, uh, money spent on diplomacy is money you don't have to spend on on the military. So let's now go to the big question, China, because obviously China is the big issue in global politics today. Under President Trump, we saw unilateralism, uh, America first. Uh, what can we expect from a Biden presidency on China? And then where does Europe position himself, itself in this great power competition? Because obviously Europe collectively appears to have a firmer stance on China now. It's a, a partner, but also a systemic rival. The language has shifted in 2019. But how can, how can the US and Europe work together on China, but also what will the Biden expectate, what will the Biden, Biden administration want to achieve vis-a-vis uh, -vis China? So, Tony, I think you get to start on that one as well. Well, I think there will be some return to a form of normality. By normality, I mean <clears throat> treatment of China um, with respect that it deserves, um, as well as any country deserves, but perhaps particularly China, and respect also for what China has done to lift hundreds of millions out of poverty. Um, and so no insults, no threats, no insults. Uh, however, being tough, 
because that's the order of the day. I think it's quite appropriate that the United States remain, remains tough. That will be the expectation from Congress and the American people. But uh, the tactics will be very different. The tactics will be, um, you know, not America alone, but America works with its allies to increase uh, pressure on China to address the structural issues in the relationship, particularly in trade. So move away from this managed trade obsession of the administration, which basically has been buy more of our stuff and we'll go away and we'll be happy. It hasn't actually resulted in uh, in any or almost anything. There have been a few moves on China to open up their financial services market, which is true. But the phase one trade deal has been essentially a failure. They haven't even come close, not surprisingly, to meeting the targets in that agreement. And of course, the, the focus of that agreement was entirely wrong. It shouldn't have just been managed trade. It should be actually addressing the structural issues. And for that, we do need our allies. And we will remain tough on the issues where we um, together need to be tough, whether it's a freedom of navigation, South China Sea, man-made, the creation of man-made islands um, on, uh, on, uh, on Taiwan. I think we'll go back to, as I said, normality in saying we reaffirm uh, the one China policy. Um, we will be tougher on human rights for sure. Uh, words that hardly were uttered by this administration, as I said before. Um, the, the scope there is not regime change, uh, not, not to think that we're going to change the situation dramatically in China, but to shine an uncomfortable light on practices which are unacceptable with regard to, you know, um, their, particularly their, their minorities, their Muslim minority in Xinjiang. Um, but beyond anything, what will really change is cooperating with the EU. Uh, in leveraging the power of our single markets to finally get the Chinese to understand that enough is enough. If they really want the system to endure uh, that we built after the Second World War and from which they have richly benefited, we actually need to make it fair. Uh, David, uh, Sabine Veyand has said that uh, Europe needs, or the world needs in fact, a down payment from China in terms of level playing field. Uh, it needs a, a renewed effort by China on all of those issues of market access, fairness, state capitalism. So do you see a complementarity between the US and Europe on all of these issues and that there, it will be relatively straightforward to cooperate or will there be differences? Well, I, I think this is one of the, the, the big challenges and uh, I, I I think none of us should underestimate the difficulty of dealing with China, right? Uh, I mean, it is it is big, it is powerful, it is growing, it is going to be uh, a force to be reckoned with, uh, and under Xi Jinping has you know ambitions of for a global a global role. Uh, some would say global domination. I'm I'm not sure it's quite that, but certainly to be you know, one of the key players on the global scene. So that's what we're dealing with. And uh, I would also say that, you know, if you've had to deal with the Chinese, as I have in, in, in trade negotiations and other negotiations, they are tough. Uh, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not easy. Uh, and and the, the dosage of um, threat leverage versus uh, bargaining is not easy to establish. Uh? In, in any given situation. So this is this is a, a common problem, uh, and I don't think we should pretend it's easy. Uh, I, I, I hope very much that the Biden administration takes the approach that Tony has, has suggested. I mean, I think what was wrong with the, the Trump approach, it was pure confrontation, uh, and it was ultimately looking even to decouple China from the global economy, uh, and in that way to somehow cripple China. This is futile, it will not happen. Uh, and China will not allow companies like uh, Huawei or uh, ZTE to fail. And by the way, China can decouple itself from us more quickly than we can decouple China. And we need to be aware of that. So we need a mix of being tough on the areas that Tony has mentioned, and I agree completely, and you quote Sabine as well, uh, on the economic issues, on the uh, investment issues, the forced technology transfer, all of that basket of issues. Uh, we need to be tough. Uh, we also need, I think, to continue to be tough on, on, on the human rights issue. I mean, Hong Kong is going to be very difficult. I mean, I think we all hate what is happening in Hong Kong and view it with huge disappointment. 
Can we do much about it at the end of the day? I'm not so sure. Uh, I, uh, I used to have to, when, when we held summits with China, one of my jobs was to hand over to the Chinese delegation a list of human rights offenders who were jailed, whose cases we wanted to mention. I used to worry that doing this um, would actually make life worse for the individuals on the list. It, it turned out that apparently it actually did help them. But just trying to find a senior Chinese official who would take the envelope out of my hands was a major challenge. Uh, and I, I usually ended up giving it to the most junior third secretary in the room who was kind of told, okay, you take the envelope. Um, so it's not simple. Now, I, I say that flippantly and I'm not being flippant about the, the situation of people in, in jail in China by any means. It's just the difficulty of it. But I, I hope that we can find uh, a greater commonality of purpose by trying to mix the confrontation with the engagement, because we need China in certain areas. We have to find ways of working with China. We have to find space for China in the global community, because we're not going to, you know, we'll either, they'll either, we will give them that space in which they can be constructive or they will take it and be destructive. So I, I think this is the debate we have to have. Uh, and I, I, I think it's very important that we do this jointly with the US, with other like-minded countries, uh, allies in Asia and elsewhere. Uh, but we have to be very careful that this does not uh, be counterproductive by giving China the impression it's them against the rest of the world, and we know how that ends. So getting that balance is crucial. But I agree uh, that there is an opportunity with this new administration uh, to kind of do things differently, even if we basically share the, the same objectives. Thank you. I've just, from the audience, got the Brexit question. So uh, when uh, Joe Biden was vice president, then uh, the UK was still a member of the EU. It no longer is. So a question to both of you, how does Britain's non-membership of the EU, but obviously as a, a critical member of NATO, how does that impact transatlantic relations? And is, for example, climate, given that the UK will have COP26, is this one way of re-knitting some of the uh, ruptures that we see happening. So perhaps, David, if I ask you to begin on Brexit. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I think um, President Biden's or future President Biden's views on Brexit are known. He didn't think it was a great idea. Um, it's happened. It's a reality now. Um, some people have suggested he might be anti-British. I don't believe that for a moment. I think he will greatly value uh, the, the importance of the relationship between the US and the UK, as, as have all previous American presidents. Uh, and I think he will want good relations with the UK. Um, I think the usefulness uh, of the UK to the US as a partner and an ally is somewhat diminished by the departure from the EU. I think America would have preferred that the UK remained in the EU. It's It would be better for many ways. This is not the choice of the British people. This is not where we are. So they will continue to, to work together. Um, I think that uh, a US-UK trade deal is possible. Um, I, I, Tony sort of said, I, I agree, but I mean, it won't be a priority. Trade deals will not be a priority for this, this administration in the first few months. Trade promotion authority runs out at the end of June. Uh, will a, a Republican controlled Congress or Republican controlled Senate give uh, a Democratic president uh, trade promotion authority easily, maybe if it's to do a deal with the UK, but I don't know. So it's it's not going to be simple. Uh, but I also agree that it, in principle, it's, it's, it's a logical thing to do. But the one thing where I think uh, there may be some conflict is undoubtedly over Northern Ireland. Uh, President Biden, future President Biden, values deeply his Irish heritage. He doesn't hide this. Uh, his frequent quoting of Irish poets, not because they're Irish, but because they are the best. Uh, shows where his heart lies on this issue. And he will be very, very vigilant about anything related to Brexit, which could potentially negatively impact the situation on the island of Ireland. And I think that's something that he has already said publicly, and I'm absolutely certain that he will do that. And by the way, he will have a lot of support in Congress 
uh, for that. So that's the one flashpoint that I think needs to be watched. I agree that climate is perhaps a, a, a first moment where you could have a sort of US, UK, EU cooperation in, in COP26 uh, with the kind of roles that we played in Paris with the US trying to put the pressure on China, the EU delivering Africa, and the ACP countries and so forth. So I think there is scope there uh, for, for, for good cooperation. So, you know, I, I think it's it's less useful out of out of the EU, but still still will be an important uh, ally and partner of the United States. I I, I agree, of course, with everything that David says. With all, uh, <laughs> I'm actually rather bullish. I'm bullish. Look, no one is going to forget the statements that were made by um, some members of the Conservative Party about Hillary Clinton or about Obama and so forth. But no, everyone's an adult here. I mean, this is water under the bridge. We all know what the Obama administration thought about Brexit. And I think, by the way, the analysis that we did is turning out to be accurate. But you know what? It doesn't matter. It, it was a decision taken by a sovereign democratic country, close ally, and it's going to happen. No desire to reopen it. Um, I, I say bullish because I think there is a broad and deep agenda here with the UK. Yes, I think the EU is is poor, um, intellectually poor, and shorn of certain capacities, uh, military security capacities, law enforcement, um, intellectual capacities that are driving key debates. But but still. Uh, well, the EU will remain a critical partner, and the UK will. A few areas have been mentioned by David, I agree. Climate is one of them, right, um, which is going to be on the top of our agenda as well. But not only climate, I think the fact that the UK has been very forward-leaning, even rather courageous on the issues of human rights is going to go down rather well. Um, and the fact that the UK remains a committed actor uh, on multilateralism and free trade uh, is going to go down well. The fact that it's been rather courageous on Russia and sanctions is going to go down rather well. So, you know, those are just a few areas uh, where I think there is a real agenda and a desire to, um, to, to interact and, and collaborate with the UK. Uh, we haven't spoken a lot about technology and clearly it regulating big tech, taxing big tech, these are big ticket items, both for the EU and for the US. Are, will the approaches be complementary or competitive, conflictual? What do you expect on tech, particularly the, the platforms? Well, maybe I'll start because, uh, yes. um, I mean, Europe is probably the the actor in this. Um, I mean, there are three there are three issues, in my view. There is the digital sales tax issue. There is the regulation of platforms, and then there's the data transfer, uh, the, the sort of successor of Privacy Shield, which in turn was a successor of Safe Harbor. Um, uh, maybe we should stop giving these things names. They might be more successful in court. Um, I, I, I think on the digital sales tax, it's all down to what can be done in the OECD. Uh, and there, frankly, the US under Trump was not particularly constructive. At least that was certainly the European take. Um, will the Biden administration be willing to engage uh, more constructively in order to head off um, uh, a series of national digital sales taxes, which could have counterproductive results? That's to be tested. Um, on the regulation of the platforms, uh, we have the Digital Services Act, which is upcoming uh, uh, from the European side. Um, there's going to be consultations. Uh, it will, of course, then go through the legislative process. So the US will, in its usual way, be able to express its views and, and try to influence the, the outcome. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Tony can comment. I, I think the Biden administration will be slightly conflicted on this issue because I think there is quite a lot of support in the more progressive side of the of the Democratic Party for doing something about about big tech. They they understand the the issues. On the other hand, let's be very frank: big tech has been a big supporter of of, of Biden and the Democrats, and is is not without making their contribution. So mm, I, I don't know. Uh, it will, it will, a lot will depend on, on precisely what it is that the commission ends up proposing and, and member states and, and parliament end up um, agreeing. Uh, 
On the um, data stuff, I mean, Tony and myself have labored in this vineyard together. It's very difficult. Um, uh, the, the striking down of, of Safe Harbor was complicated. Rebuilding the privacy shield was a Herculean effort, which I must say, uh, Commissioner Yorova in particular made a, a, did a very good job, I thought. I, I thought we had kind of made it, I won't say judgment proof, but I thought we had addressed the concerns of the court. It turns out we, we hadn't. I agree with Tony that the, the, the opinion of the court doesn't leave a lot of room for maneuver is the problem. Um, but we'll have to sit down and see what we can do uh, uh, and have another go. Uh, and I, I must say I would much rather be doing that with a, a Biden administration than trying to do it with a, a Trump administration, which was not really willing to, to take the issue seriously at all. I mean, you have the vexed issue of surveillance. Which is very very delicate uh, on the u.s side and i perfectly understand that and some on the u.s side think we're a bit hypocritical because we criticize their surveillance but then we don't really regulate at european level national surveillance uh, and some of our member states have actually pretty intrusive rules about uh, um, uh, data surveillance uh, but there may be a way forward uh, to 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 put together uh, another agreement because I do think this is this is one of the critical areas, the whole tech area, and it links to Tony's point about standards uh, and who defines the standards. Uh, and I think when when we and the Americans disagree, uh, we may feel we we get temporarily get the upper hand. They may feel they temporarily get the upper hand in one area or another. But ultimately, we're losing the opportunity jointly to be the ones who set what then becomes a, a global standard. And I think that's something we need to really think a lot about, particularly in this tech area. Tony, absolutely. Look, look on, on privacy. It, this is going to be a difficult debate. You know, some in Europe I hear often saying. There are two solutions to this. The first is encryption, which I mentioned before, and the second is data localization. Neither is a great answer. Well, the first is not a good answer for law enforcement. The second is not a good answer because there are real costs to, to pay um, in, in terms of inefficiencies and also um, you know, a lost opportunity in terms of really monetizing uh, data. There are some things that we can do. We may be moving toward a federal privacy act, which will, I think, go some way to address the view in Europe that we have a mosaic of privacy laws that somehow don't um, amount to uh, the same structure, coherent structure as the GDPR. It'll only go so far. There are some tweaks, I think David would, might agree, in terms of the roles and responsibilities of certain um, uh, People, for example, the uh, ombudsman, the State Department, whose role it was to be a, a, a gatekeeper and, and to respond to concerns that were expressed by European citizens, but that's only going to go so far. The real issue is judicial redress for European citizens in U.S. courts. Is it ever going to be the same? And there I'm rather skeptical because in Congress, the view is why should we do this? Why should we do this? Why should we interfere with the way we go about our um, tasks of collecting uh, information and often, by the way, sharing it with our allies who uh, are appreciative, at least behind closed doors. So this is really tough. I'm more optimistic about uh, some of the digital economy issues. Here I don't mean structural reforms. I agree we're going to be conflicted on this for sure. I don't think we're about to break up the platforms as we broke up big oil and we uh, broke up AT&T, but I think there's a lot that we can do in terms of improving transparency and accountability of the platforms. And that shouldn't be particularly difficult or controversial. And by that, I mean making sure that these platforms are more transparent in terms of the policies that they uh, espouse, that they should be published, they should be available for everybody, and there should be third party um, uh, agencies that, that look into see whether the companies actually are living up to their responsibilities. And particularly with regard to the algorithms that drive a lot of decision making, there might even be auditing of what lies behind those algorithms, how they're structured, whether they result in bias or other decisions that we find troubling, uh, troublesome. Uh, we should certainly look at the impact of these platforms in terms of the quality of our democratic debate and whether or not we can do something about the virality, the speed at which disinformation travels around the internet? Can we slow it down in some instances? Are the platforms really doing everything they can to identify and take down uh, harmful, illegal information? 
These are things where the EU actually has been far more active and far reaching and far sighted than the United States. And we, uh, I believe, should be cooperating with them uh, on those topics. Thank you. We're, we're coming to an end soon, but I want to, uh, Stephanie, you've listened now to this discussion and conversation about transatlantic relations. Thinking the next two years and then perhaps four, where do you think uh, this essential relationship, which I think, Tony, is what you, essential partnership is what you called it, where, where will it be in two years, four years' time? Wow, I wish I would have a crystal ball right now so I can give a, a, a more informed inf uh, answer. But no, I think, and I think this has been pointed out by both David and Tony, there are some uh, construction sites that are easier to actually now work in than, than in others. And I think NATO actually might, might be one of them so that we actually have an alliance again um, in which um, the US uh, can talk to its European allies and vice versa, and nobody is afraid that immediate abandonment is possible. I mean, it was mentioned already that the troop, that the US troops that had left Germany will be stationed there again. It's a, that's a potentiality, right? So the signals are there to take NATO seriously, um, which to me might mean that Europeans might take strategic autonomy not as seriously um, at all, right? So that the signal will also show Macron will, will ride on this strategic autonomy and continues talking about it. I'm not so sure that other countries will, will buy into it as much as he does. So in that sense, I think uh, from a security perspective, transatlantic relations will be reinforced. Now, I, I can speak less to, to, um, to issues of, of, of China or of, of um, tech and, and uh, the internet per se policies, but I, I do think from what I've, I've read at least, uh, that I'm a little bit more worried that, I mean, I think that this frictions will be, uh, there's a potential for frictions, but at the same time, and that's what I meant with my last questions about expectations, these frictions are not new, right? I mean, it's not like the US and European countries and or the U European Union have not disagreed on issues before. I mean, Boeing and Airbus, that's what I had in class um, at the beginning of the 2000s, we were talking about this, right? So these issues recur, but, um, I think the style in which these will be debated will change a lot again. I mean, a move from Trump to Biden, from what we see, shows that there will that there is a, an appreciation and for both sides for different arguments, as well as um, the will to actually move forward, given domestic constraints. Yeah, keeping con domestic constraints in mind. I mean, we mentioned the Senate, so um, when we see in Georgia whether the two senators that will be elected will be Democrats, that's great. If not, um, it's very likely that certain um, policies, especially when it comes to trade, I think when it comes to China, I think also when it comes to tech, um, will, will constrain uh, Biden to a certain degree. So, ambassadors, I have one final question for both of you, but I want you to switch sides. So, Tony, you have to write a memo to Ursula von der Leyen advising her on what three things she should really concentrate on in terms of transatlantic in order to manage the expectations that Stephanie so rightly identified? Well, this is so easy for us to do because we kind of had a lot of practice doing this. <laughs> um, no, seriously, uh, or perhaps not seriously, just taking a lot of U.S. chlorinated chicken and hormone-treated beef. Um, no, no, I'm not, I'm not serious about that. What really would, I think it comes down to one thing. Um, the Congress is going to be looking toward the EU and say, what good is the EU for us? I mean, to put it bluntly, how can they help us achieve our objectives on China, period? And um, this is going to be a difficult debate. You know, uh, I, I understand, fully appreciate for the EU. But I would say to, to the president, um, please do some work upstream meaning before January 20th, to see where, uh, you know, on what issues can the EU show its relevance, to be brutally, to put it brutally, to the United States on trade with China to get results that the U.S. would appreciate. Thank you. David, to Joe Biden. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would say, look, these, these um, 
Europeans are a, a cacophonous and, and, and sort of disorganized bunch, but basically they're your best allies and you can work with them, uh, but you need to identify some fairly specific projects where you can, you can get results. Uh, and, you know, the, the short list is of what we've already defined, whether that's security and defense or trade or digital or China. But the key thing is to, is to figure out uh, what are the most promising and that that requires a bit like Tony has just said, uh, some back channel work uh, and to Stephanie's point about managing expectations so that, you know, not not rushing out with public declarations that this is, you know, this is this is what we absolutely have to have. And then, of course, you don't get it. So I, I think it needs uh, behind the scene work to, to identify a common agenda from the list we've got, which is, you know, fairly clear and, and shared, I think, by both sides. Uh, and, and only when you feel you've got some buy in uh, on that to then go a bit more public and say, okay, this is this is going to be our agenda for the next six, 12 months or whatever. Um, so I think that's the key, the key thing. Uh, just before uh, we sign off, there is a question from the audience asking about Trump as an enabler of authoritarian regimes in Europe and what our expectations can be from Biden vis-a-vis -vis Poland and Hungary. So Tony, just a last word. Well, in 30 said, look, there's a reason why uh, Viktor Orban and Kaczynski and company are not happy with the results of this election. Uh, and they, I think they have a good reason not to be happy. Um, Biden administration will be much more outspoken, not interfering in European politics. The EU needs to sort out its own domestic agenda in terms of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and whether they're respected. But a Biden administration will be more outspoken about the key principles of independence of judiciary, independence of the media. And God knows, by the way, we put up our hand. Last four years, we've seen how important these principles are. So, you know, we need to say this with humility, but they're important. So thank you. Thank all three of you for this, our first Schumann conversation. And in fact, it was Stephanie, because I talked to her about uh, how we get a how we get events on transatlantic going she said we need conversation so this was the first conversation uh, on uh, the next phase of transatlantic relations i want to thank all of you very warmly for your time and your availability and also for the richness of our conversation thank you very much and thank also to our audience out there, uh, I have. I think we're on YouTube. I, I never quite know nowadays what platform we're on, but I think we're on YouTube today. So thank you all very much for your participation. Much appreciated. Thank you. Are we off?